On TNT, Microsoft taking more pot shots at Android. Alibaba still wants Yahoo, but Yahoo says we're fine. Why Ceasefire got the iPhone 4S, and it's actually a different story depending on who you ask. And Google getting facelifts all over the place. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, October 20th, 2011. The 7 News Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford, featuring Wi-Fi connectivity with available sync and my Ford Touch. Now your car can be a Wi-Fi hotspot. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Vast Conference, the ultimate in professionalism, clarity, and flexibility for your conference calls, all at a low price. For two Vast Conference calls free with no commitment, go to VastConference.com and use the promo code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm Jason Owl. And where's Tom? Tom's on his way to BlizzCon. So he is off today and I believe tomorrow. We're holding down the fort in his absence with the help from none other than Julio Ojeda Zapata, who is the technology columnist at the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Hi again, Julio. Hey you know, the last time we uh, saw you, you were actually sitting in Ayaz's chair. And I was sitting where Jason You were visiting lives. us in, <laughs> in our new Twit Brick House. So good to see you, even if it's remotely. I was wearing two hats at the time, uh, tech tourist and, and show guest. Very good. You, you, you wore them well, Julio. Well, we're so happy to have you uh, make sense of some of this news today. Quite a bit of news, uh, global news, I guess you could call it. Yeah, well, thank goodness the Asia D conference is going on because people just talk and that's news because otherwise, very little. Yeah, so Asia D, of course, is all things D conferences going on this week in Hong Kong. And we've had a lot of people say some very interesting things from Asia D. Uh, we'll start with Microsoft's uh, president of Windows Phone, Andy Lees, who said, well, he had a lot of uh, stuff to say. Uh, first of all, he said, Windows Phone 7 has sold more in his first 12 months on the market than Android did. Now, when I first read that quote, I was like, well, what? No, that's not true. But actually, it makes perfect sense because when Android first came out, it was the, what, the... The G1. The G1. That was like the only Android phone for a while, and then other form factors came out. But then again, I think so someone brought this up in one of these posts that we've read, that uh, Microsoft introduced Windows Phone 7 in a very mature smartphone market versus being the second other... Well, I guess Rim had the first smartphone, right? So I guess the thing to compare to the iPhone anyway. Right. So people were ready for these touchscreen phones now compared yeah. to when Android came out. It's like, well, there's the iPhone, and then there's this other one. So test that out. Yeah, it's kind of a cheap shot. I mean... Android has spent quite quite a bit of time in the market with a variety of headsets paving the way for something like Windows Phone 7 to come to the market. And people say, oh, yeah, an, another OS, but smartphone. We got it. Uh, he also said, uh, and this is, it sounds like he and Steve Ballmer agree, that Android is very techy, uh, says Andy Lees. It's a great OS for a certain population, but Android hits you with a grid of apps instead of taking a people approach. So they're really, they're really driving home the message that Windows Phone 7 is just for Everyone non-geeky. So wait, Windows Phone? Because phones? Android just simply can't apply to the Because it's in a grid. Is that the theory? Because tiles are, are tiles themselves more people friendly? What, what, what well, do you think? Do you think Android is Well, I, 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 happen, I happen to agree because um, I find Windows Phone, I, I, I know, I've seen Windows Phone uh, devices in the wild. A couple of my, my son's teachers uh, at his school use Windows Phone, and I recommend Windows Phone to people that are not, you know, very nerdy, very geeky, because the, uh, it's a very accessible mobile operating system. It's easy to understand. It's not that confusing. Um, I, I, I happen to agree wholeheartedly with that statement, and that's why I, I steer people towards the Microsoft Store at the Mall of America, which has an Apple Store directly across. I tell people, go to the Microsoft Store, go to the Apple Store, compare, uh, you're, you're going to find stuff to like in both places. Jason, do you ever get on All About Android, for example? I mean, I, I, I can feel you sort of being like, what? How, how, how is Android just only for tech? I mean, do you ever have people saying, well, we want to follow your show and the Android operating system, but it's just too geeky? I think most people who've spent a decent amount of time with Android would probably agree that there's a certain level of 
kind of technical uh, technical thinking that which that is what is, they like that is kind of required to really be comfortable using Android. Mm -hmm. um, but then I but then again, and you know, my wife, I wouldn't necessarily say that she's not you know not to, like completely not adept with technology, but she's not a huge technology person. She runs Android and she's able to use it very well and get it to do the things. Of course. I happen to help her with, you know, with things from time to time, but I think that's probably going to be the case with any of these things. But I totally agree. I actually agree wholeheartedly that Android, just as a, a, a smartphone platform, is probably the least immediately accessible to people who don't already think with a technological mind. If that Although, makes sense. you know, one of the things that Android users can claim is that they've got a nice open OS. Windows Phone has gotten some heat in the past for being less open. Andy Lee says we do that on purpose. We want to stop problems with fragmentation. We lock a lot of things down on purpose. Again, it's kind of an Android dig. We want partners to add volume, value, rather, but not in a way that's chaotic. So they're, they're really trying to position themselves as the friendly, accessible, no mention of Apple here, but if you're talking about Google versus Microsoft, Microsoft is the people's phone. Google well, the, is the phone that's confusing for others. The other thing is Lee took a dig at Android saying they were flattered that the People Hub, mm. actually the People app looks a lot like their hub, so I guess it's becoming more friendly by stealing from Microsoft a little there or being <laughs> copied there. So that was kind of a neat thing. But when it comes to the whole fragmentation argument, I mean, Microsoft, I thought, did a pretty smart approach here because Android suffered a bit because you didn't, when it came to developers, they didn't know what exactly they were developing for. You had different mm -hmm. form factors. You didn't know if something had a keyboard or if it had a slider or if it had no keyboard or your screen sizes were different the resolutions were different with with microsoft locking it down a little bit more uh people would have a somewhat of a what's the word a uniform experience you could switch to phone to phone to phone and know what's going on still isn't that always going to be the case like when it when it comes down to it if it's a an open platform or what some people like to say about android is that it's a air quotes open platform right. i mean if it's open and there's going to be a lot of different manufacturers giving their own interpretations of what kind of devices run this os i mean yes it may be confusing to the end user but i mean that's just kind of part of it being open and it being you know in the hands of the manufacturers and developers to kind of create that. It kind of sucks for some developers, but I mean, that's just the choice you make, right? When you choose one or the other, or is that wrong? No, it's, uh, uh, go ahead. Every, well, average consumers don't care if a phone, uh, phone OS is open or, or not. They don't even know what that means. Yeah. They just want to get to their stuff and Windows Phone is great for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, another uh, a dig at Apple this time. Uh, Andy Lee says, Siri really isn't super useful. No, no. Windows phone, Windows phone 7 voice implementations rely on Bing, and then he said, which is kind of funny, which harnesses the full power of the Internet rather than just a certain subset. So I guess what he's referring to is Siri using Wolfram Alpha and, and Yelp. Uh, those are two integrated services, but have capacity to use the Internet. So maybe for research. I'm only saying Bing is great. What maybe. else are you gonna say, really? It's like, hey, do you like Siri? What do you guys got? It's, well, Siri doesn't use Bing, so Siri's not good enough. What else like, are you gonna say? It's just an odd thing. I mean, he could have said, Siri. We we are impressed with Siri, and that would have been headlines. That's probably what they were avoiding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, some news. Um, Mr. Lee says NFC chipsets are going to ship on Windows Phone 7 devices. They say they don't really want to compete with Google on a platform level if there's already a payment system in existence that people are using. And also, LTE might be around the bend. So if we've got Windows phones on LTE, we've got Android phones on LTE, Apple... Uh, would be a glaring omission at that point if everyone's on the LTE train. And then there's Rim. They might have had a 4G playbook, but that didn't ever seem yeah, to happen. Yeah, that was out. a rumor that never happened. Julio, I mean, do you think Apple's really missing out if, if Windows Phone 7 now gets on LTE along with, with uh, Android? I don't think so. I think the timing for uh, rollout of LTE on iPhones next year with the iPhone 5 or whatever they're going to call it is exactly right. Because now Verizon LTE is fairly pervasive, but AT&T is not. Um, I think Apple's giving AT&T a little time to deploy their network uh, so that LTE is a little more widespread. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it may it just it just makes more sense. Uh, this is a, this is a marathon; it's not a sprint. It's, so it's it's just going to play out gradually. Yeah, it seems like. I mean, that's that's where everyone's going eventually. It's just a matter of timing. More news from Asia D this time surrounding Yahoo and. The story is different depending on who you ask. Um, 
Jerry Yang was on stage, uh, who really, I mean, he, uh, he was with a senior VP um, of Yahoo, Rose So, I think her last name is pronounced, uh, sat down with Walt Mossberg and really talked up Yahoo. I mean, they are like, we want to be, what, what, do, what do they want to call themselves? Well, Mossberg wanted to ask directly, but he, he didn't. You know, what, what does Yahoo do? And so he asked, why should 700 million people keep going to Yahoo? Mm -hmm. And Yang's response was, everyone who works at Yahoo, what we want to do, we want to be the premier digital media company. Okay. So they want to be the premier digital media company. Uh-huh. They're not, well. What does that even mean? Arguably not anywhere near there yet. Exactly. What it, does that mean? That, that's the thing. I mean, Mossberg was also confused, too. It's like, well, you wouldn't say that YouTube is that premier thing or Amazon or what exactly does that mean? And Yang really didn't give a clear answer still. He didn't. Yeah. So you think digital media company. Well, video certainly has to play into that, right? Uh, Jerry, Jerry Yang says, you can watch videos. On Yahoo, mm -hmm. uh, we've got news, we've got finance, we've got sports, we've got entertainment. So he's being very general. I mean, he's not talking about anything specific. He even says Yahoo Mail, big deal, you know, because that's premier digital media, Yahoo Mail. And even uh, when press saying, but haven't people left Yahoo Mail to go to other services? Uh, they, Jerry uh, Yang says, no, no, people are still using Yahoo Mail. Numbers are up. More said, engagement than ever before. He said the mail isn't declining. The number of messages are up. I mean, you, do you judge mail by messages or by accounts? Right. It's like well, there it, are fewer users, but they're very active. Yeah, and and I don't know if I'm the only one here, but my once often used Yahoo Mail uh, inbox is now riddled with spam. So me if messages are up, does it right. really matter? Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. It's just all spam in my case. Are you engaged with the spam? That's the question. <laughs> Are you really uh, paying attention? You mean I, I have to log into my Yahoo Mail account in order for me to engage with it? So no. <laughs> so no. Julio, what do you make of all of this? I, it's to 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 me. I'm very confused. I'm confused about the message that Yahoo is trying to send. Obviously, everyone knows that uh, that that there is talk of the company being sold, who it might sell to. What's what's their angle here? Um, well, I think. Uh, Yahoo is just is just kind of uh, it's kind of desperate at this point, and it's just kind of throwing things against the wall to see what will stick. Um, but I, I used to be a Yahoo super user. I used to love the uh, Yahoo services the way I love G, uh, Google services now. And I just had bad experience after bad experience after bad experience, and uh, it just got to the point where I just got disgusted and I left. And that's kind of the bottom line, I think. Google is brilliant in how it has just worked and worked and worked at its services. Just made them, you know, really fantastic. I go back and I take a look at Yahoo Maps and I take a look at uh, Yahoo Mail and it's, uh, it's 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 disappointing. It's depressing, you know, the uh, the state of those services compared to the Google equivalents, which are evolving at light speed. And that's real, really the bottom line. If they if they take their eye off of, off the ball and don't really put their heart and soul into these services, you know, what's the point? Now, Walt Mossberg also asked um, Senior VP Rose So about Yahoo's growth in Asia, um, obviously a big emerging market, and she they were they got very excited at that point. Uh, yes, yes, Asia, very big deal. They think in the next three years, 100 million users coming online through uh, mobile access, okay, but not smartphone access, feature phone access, and she, she, she mentioned specifically China and India. Which makes me think, okay, I, uh, I understand that feature phones are an extremely big part of mobile access in both of those countries as well as others. But in three years, well, I feel like things are going to change quite a bit. You would think that smartphones would take over entirely, but the, the feature set that show up on feature phones nowadays are starting to mimic more and more of a smartphone feel. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like a great long-term strategy to put, putting your money in, in this kind of thing. I mean, if, if you want to be big over in, in mobile, shouldn't you have something more than feature phones? I, I, it's, I don't get it. It's like, okay, so Yahoo Mail is great and we're going to do feature phones, but it's 2011. Right. It's the wrong time to have this strategy, I think. That just, it just feels like Yahoo doing more of the same thing, mm -hmm. where yes, they can certainly appeal to someone who has a feature phone and give access to people who are accessing their services in the internet in general that way. But it's not forward thinking. It's just not forward thinking. And I mean, yeah, they got to do something. Something's going to happen with Yahoo. Now, of course, Alibaba's Jack Ma's still hoping that it's going to be Alibaba buying Yahoo. 
Uh, he was also on stage at Asia D. Pretty much everybody was on stage uh, this week. And uh, he says, we haven't changed our minds. The Yahoo board knows that we want to buy Yahoo. We want to buy Yahoo in its entirety. We've been talking to them in the past over the years about buying either the whole company or sections of it. But that's what we want. They know it. Uh, and he seems to... It's, it's, it, he was talking to Peter Kafka on stage. It seems to be almost a part of a nostalgia thing for him, that, that he, he, he feels that he owes Yahoo uh, some credit for helping him start his companies back in the day. It's almost like he wants it under his belt for that reason. Yeah, and the, the weird thing is, I don't think I've, I can't recall the last time I've seen a CEO be so public about trying to buy another company. Right. I mean, it's okay, first he says it at, at a subsidiary. Oh, yeah, we have $20 billion just laying around. We can buy Yahoo. Then he goes on stage and says, yeah, I want to buy them because without Yahoo, I wouldn't have started my Internet business. And uh, he wants to help Yahoo. I mean, who? Wh I mean, when was the last time this has happened? It's like, yeah, look, we're the guys. We're going to buy this. They even asked, um, they asked Jerry Yang well, when he was on, well, what do you want to happen? Do you want a mm -hmm. private equity firm? Do you want to go private? Do you want to buy it, Jerry, or do you want Jack Ma? And he didn't give an answer. And, but Jack's like, I'm right here, 20 billion bucks. I got it. But they're still looking for partners, it looks like. Yeah, uh, uh, Jack Ma also said, listen, if it ended up that we did buy Yahoo, I'd get rid of management. I'd hire a bunch of new people. They'd need to clean that place out. I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty much what he said. Julio, what do you think? Is Alibaba the right company to uh, acquire Yahoo? Uh, I'm not really the, the best, best judge of that, but I, uh, I, I, I feel that Yahoo has, has a bright future, but it doesn't have a bright future as an independent company. It's got uh, pieces that are fantastic. Flickr, I use Flickr religiously still. And those need to find a home where they're going to thrive. They're not really thriving right now. And that's that's kind of my bottom line. Um, and this, this suitor looks as, about as good as any, I suppose. Uh, another report um, on the subject coming from Reuters. Uh, Reuters is reporting that Yahoo is banning crosstalk as part of the bidding process for his company, which means that there's a non-disclosure agreement that Yahoo is making any potential suitor sign if they want access to non-public financial data, which of course they would if they were going to buy a company, they need that information, forcing them to agree to not discuss bidding plans with any other company that might also be considering making an offer for Yahoo. That said, in many cases, a single, there, there aren't a lot of Alibabas out there. A single company is not necessarily going to just be able to scoop up Yahoo. In many cases, it's a, it's a, maybe it's a, like a consortium. Yeah, exactly. To, to get Two or more uh, companies that band together and decide we've got enough money and, and we, we share a certain value. To get $20 billion together in the first place is, is pretty difficult. And the thing about Yahoo stopping this crosstalk, I mean, it makes it look like, this when, when I'm seeing this, it looks like, Yahoo doesn't want to be bought up by 15 different companies right. and have 15 different people to tell them what to do. If theoretically Microsoft bought them because they have the extra cash, or Apple did because they have the extra cash, or Alibaba because they say they have the cash, I mean, at least you'd have some kind of singular focus driving this, the, the company again, hopefully. But somebody out there needs to do this because, I mean, it's, it's, Yahoo's kind of directionless. And even when you have the guys up at, uh, at Asia D and they don't, they don't seem to be saying anything that makes a lot of sense, they kind of need some direction. It's kind of interesting to see that everyone would be fired if Jack Ma bought it, though. So I guess what Yahoo's saying is, listen, if we give you our financial information, you then can't, it, let's say it's, let's say it's Microsoft. I mean, this is very hypothetical. You can't then go over to Google and compare notes and try to figure out, you know, the best way to, I don't know, undercut us type thing. But if you were to both get together and decide that you're interested in the company and this is why you're better as a team than separately, then let's talk. Right. Like if, if there was, I would assume, some kind of like joint venture company, let's say they were both partners in there, that kind of thing I think technically gets around this kind of these, these uh, NDAs or whatever, they, there's no crosstalk. But I mean, I don't know exactly what the details of their, the agreements in the first place. It could maybe even stop something like that. Mm -hmm. If you've already seen our stuff, you can't join up and, do, and try to buy us. Hulu, have you, have you heard of uh, companies having non-disclosure agreements like this when they're potentially up for sale? See, it seems a little unusual. Um, I'm, just, I'm just hoping uh, Yahoo doesn't, just doesn't blow it again. I have the sinking feeling in my stomach that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to torpedo this thing the way it did the, the Microsoft thing. I hope, I hope it doesn't. You know, something along these lines needs to happen very soon. All right, let's take a moment to thank Ford. Uh, they're sponsoring this episode of TNT, and Ford is great. Uh, in fact, one of the latest technologies 
from Ford Sync with my Ford Touch is Wi-Fi connectivity, meaning you're on a road trip, you've got a full car, you've got a bunch of people who need internet access, you can turn your car into a, into a Wi-Fi hotspot. It's amazing, up to access to up to five devices at once. Think of how helpful that would be. Uh, you establish an internet connection to the Wi-Fi hotspot by just plugging in a portable wireless access card into a USB port. They've got a couple of those right in the center armrest console. It's awesome. If you have a BlackBerry, you can connect to the hotspot wirelessly via Bluetooth. Uh, up to five Wi-Fi enabled devices, like I said, to the hotspot. Uh, you have a secure password, so you don't have to worry about somebody, you know, school bus passing you and anybody tapping into your internet connection because school buses go really fast, obviously. And and that's it. Uh, your passengers can access pretty much anything on the internet via Wi-Fi connection. So, you know, if you've got crappy 3G, that sort of thing, all of a sudden you've got your, your uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. Ford Sync with My Ford Touch featuring Wi-Fi connectivity is available in the 2012 Ford Focus uh, with other models available soon. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. It's amazing stuff. Leo even said on iPad today that he's getting the new Ford Focus electric model. I can't wait to try it out. All right, moving on now to not cease fire, but it the company like sounds fire. a lot like cease fire. See Spire getting that iPhone 4S a little bit more information about why they're getting the iPhone 4S, which was my first question. How did, how did this little company end up getting the iPhone? Yeah, right now, there are two competing theories out there. Uh, so took a look at PC Mags. Uh, Sasha Sagan wrote a piece, and his theory is that this is actually ending up to help AT&T. So this is, all, this is all hypothetical. He doesn't, he doesn't say that this is actually what happened. He thinks this is what happened, though. He figures that AT&T and, and Apple have been working together for a very long time, and because small carrier complains that big carriers prevent the little guys from getting the great phones, AT&T might have asked Apple, hey, how about you give this phone to a small regional company, and then it won't look like we are stopping competition so they can buy T-Mobile in the long run. Now, Wired had a totally different take on this. They, this was uh, Christina Bonington. And she said, partnering with a carrier in an un underserved area where smartphones don't yet rule the roost, could provide Apple with a large number of potential new adopters, basically saying the people that are on Cellular South aren't using smartphones. Uh, that, I think, Julio, you talked to Seaspire. Uh, is, yeah, is that, is that even got, true? Yeah, I got on the phone with them uh, for about an hour today and had a very in-depth conversation with them. And here's what I think. Um, I think Apple took a look at this company and was impressed. Uh, the company, I'm, I'm getting this from the company. I don't, haven't verified this. But the, they told me their their smartphone penetration is over 50%. They, 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 they tell me that they lead the country in landline replacement. Um, they have a full suite of devices. They have the Samsung Galaxy S. They have RIM devices. They have about eight Android phones. They have HTC Windows Phone 7 devices. Um, they're, a very, they're a very slick company. My impression was, you know, they're, ver they're, they're, um, they're a company that Apple would want to do business with. They would not tell me anything about their negotiations with Apple or you know when the iPhone is going to come out or anything along those lines. But just speaking generally with this company, I came away very impressed and I suspect Apple uh, also did. And what, what the Wired piece said is just appears to be patently false. Um, uh, smartphone usage in that, air, in that Southeast United States area is soaring. It, the, the South is not a techno technologically backward place, uh, based on my conversation. So um, there's a lot of, I think, stupid theories floating around that uh, that I I think I disapprove with this conversation I had with the company today. Now, C Spire has gone on record with Sprint opposing the AT and T T Mobile merger. Mm -hmm. Although something like C Spire getting the iPhone directly contradicts that because. Clearly, they can compete. So they might be an unwitting pawn. In a way. So it's, and it's, I don't know if that, ma I mean, they'd probably rather get the iPhone yeah, than stop a merger if they end up getting a bunch more subscribers because of it. Well, it's been selling like crazy. I mean, I'm sure it's going to help their numbers anyway. And the other thing was for Apple, this wasn't that difficult technologically because it runs on the same frequency. So it's like, oh, do you, we don't have to do anything for this? Here, here's a phone. Exactly. I don't know. Julio, what do you, what do you make of that? Uh, is C Spire backing itself into a corner by having to change its tune um, I'm not sure I understand the question but um, 
they're they're making a, I think a smart deal here. Apple, it's a good deal for Apple and a good deal good deal for Seaspire. I I think because um, it's a company. I, I after talking to Seaspire today, I'm sorry they don't serve my area because they have some very enticing deals. Like if you if your first phone, uh, you get unlimited everything for eighty dollars a month. Your second phone, unlimited everything for uh, forty dollars a month. So it works out to sixty dollars per person. Uh, you know, very, very enticing arrangement, um, and I can see where uh, people who live in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Florida will want to really take a look at this because it's um, it, it seems like a very good deal. Yeah, so C Spire, this is definitely better than blocking a merger, it sounds like. We're all in agreement on that. For if now. we were them, if we were the company, which we're not. We're not the company? We're not the company. No, we don't actually work for C Spire. Oh, good. Oh, by the way, they were, if, for those of you wondering what, who C Spire were, they, they used to be called Cellular South until fairly recently. So. Right. Which you, you mentioned earlier. That's, it's talking about the same company. Cellular South, and, C Spire. And just for, and just for background, uh, C Spire is a CDMA carrier, the same as uh, Verizon and, and Sprint. So if, you, you, if, you're, um, if you're using one of their phones somewhere else in the country, you would roam on one of those networks. So. Anybody in the audience who's uh, in the area uh, you ha is a C Spire customer uh, planning to get the iPhone? Uh, any sort of background information on, on why this is good? Let us know, TNT, at, at uh, Tech News Day at twit.tv, rather. See, when Tom's gone, it's hard to fill Tom's shoes. Let's move on to something very obvious. Captain Obvious uh, story of the day. Social and mobile usage appear to go hand in hand, I as. Oh, yeah? How about that? People are actually using social networks while on the go in 2011. So, like, what are they doing? Like, they're, are they on Facebook and Twitter and, I don't know, even LinkedIn? Yeah, actually, Facebook, uh, up to 50, uh, 57 million mobile users. This is according to Comscore's Mobile Lens uh, service. Um, an increase of 50% from 2010, Twitter, 13.4 million mobile users, up 75% from 2010. LinkedIn, 5.5 million mobile users, up 69%. That's actually probably the statistic that surprises me the most. Why would that surprise you? Well, because I, I don't know that I've really ever been active on LinkedIn on a mobile device. It could be because you have a job. That That's could be part of it. True. The economy's kind of lousy, That's and you might just have true. a smartphone. You don't have a full-fledged computer, and you're like, okay, I'm going to look for a gig. LinkedIn is usually pretty good for that. Uh, I mean, Twitter has been integrated into a lot of other phones nowadays, iOS 5. I'm sure this number is going to go up. Uh, Absolutely. Be a lot more mobile usage. But Facebook, I mean, obviously, it's growing like crazy, up 50% from 2010. I know their apps are on every smartphone. Mm -hmm. They even came out with that feature phone app. Which I think was, was a brilliant move. If you're going to, if you're going to be out there, you don't want to have to come up with your horrible feature phone style web page. Facebook has so many users; they need every user to be able to access Facebook somehow, some All way. the time, so you can be, you can check in or get those deals that they used to have or whatever they have nowadays. Overall, 72.2 million Americans access social networking sites or blogs on their mobile device in August 2011, which was an overall increase of 37 percent in the past year. Julio, what do you make of all this? To, to me, I don't see anything that's terribly surprising as far as the uptrend goes, but some of these numbers are pretty impressive. Well, I think uh, there are probably a lot of factors that play into this, and I think one of the big ones is the fact that uh, social media apps on phones, the quality of these apps is increasing fairly dramatically. Like on the iPhone, I use TweetBot, which is a masterpiece of interface design. Um, Twitter apps on Android used to be terrible, but they've, they've come a long way, like Seismic um, and Hootsuite on Android. Fantastic. Uh, Windows Phone has very good Facebook and Twitter integration, and there are also very nice um, uh, uh, third-party apps. Seismic has a wonderful app on Windows Phone 7. The Facebook app for iPhone has, has just been overhauled. Very nice. Um, and I think so. I think one of the, one of the big reasons for this is uh, people are finding social media easier to use on these devices because the apps are just getting a lot better. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, back in the day, until actually very recently, I didn't really like any other Twitter experience besides good old web Twitter. I still use it. You liked the old web Twitter? I mean, they redesigned that. I remember it used to be really horrible. I completely forgot about how bad I'm, m. I am definitely talking was. about new web Twitter as okay, in the last year. Yeah, that's pretty good. But it's true. Julio's right that, I mean, as... As apps, mobile apps, and I assume we're talking about tablet apps here. I mean, that applies to the iPad, certainly. 
even if it doesn't, um, the apps have gotten better and people uh, use mobile devices. It's a win-win situation for social and mobile. Uh, speaking of social, Google's making quite a few changes, not only cosmetic, but more deeply integrated into that, that little social network called Google Plus that a few million people are using. Yeah, so Google officially announced they're going to change things with Google Reader and some functions, social functions that were in Reader are not going to be in part of Plus. So here's what they're doing. They're going to do a new design and it's going to be kind of similar to what you've seen already with uh, the, since Google Plus showed up, you've seen the redesign of Google properties everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everything's a lot more uh, streamlined, so expect to see that in Reader. Uh, think Reader's going to work with Plus better, so the idea that you could share from Reader to Google Plus, a feature that is not built in for some reason, will be, looks like that'll be added. And uh, many of Reader's social features will be available via Google Plus. And then they're going to retire certain social functions like friending, following, and sharing link blogs inside of Reader. And they said that, well, this might annoy some of you, and that's why we'll let you export almost anything. You can export your subscriptions, shared items, friends, likes, and shared items if you want to go elsewhere. It's an interesting thing to say after making, obviously, great strides to make Google Reader more attractive to their user base. Hey, if you don't like any of this stuff, we'll give you a, a great export feature. Now, of course, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. for Google, but to make a big deal out of it after you announce what you're going to make better about the service is a little strange. I do think that this is the next logical step for Reader. Um, not only does Reader really need a redesign and has for day, since day one, but remember that Google Reader was part of that buzz functionality that ended up, uh, people ended up sharing what they were subscribed to in Google Reader on buzz without explicitly saying so. And it upset a lot of people for privacy issues. Uh, to be able to, to have Google be able to do this again better within Google Plus, of course, Buzz has now been retired, makes a lot more sense, and they've obviously le learned something from it. Julio, are you a big Google Reader user? Or are, you, are you happy with the service? Are you excited to see it uh, evolve? I'm a, I'm a massive, massive user of all these services. Um, I'm going to make a couple of points about all of this. Uh, number one, it's not unusual for Google to say, here's an exit strategy for you if you want to get out. Right. This isn't, this isn't new. Uh, Google has made this part of its core philosophy. It, it, it's uh, telling users, we want to make you happy. And if we don't make you happy, here's how to get out. It has a whole whole effort for this called the data liberation front. I like that. If, it t if Google is telling me you can leave if you want to, that makes me more loyal as a customer. Um, I, I like that very, so you, very you much. So you think being as upfront as possible is actually the best strategy? Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. But here, um, one other related point, and I'm going to rant here for a little bit if you don't mind. We don't. Um, I'm a Google Apps user. Uh, I'm a paying Google Apps user. Uh, I have associated my domain name with, uh, with a Google Apps account for a long time. And one of the things that really annoys the hell out of me is how new features are rolled out to generic Google accounts before Google Apps accounts. Like right now, I can't um, use uh, uh, Google Plus with my Google Apps account. That's, that's about to change, I hear. But that's just one of many, many examples. Of, like Google Voice was another good example. I couldn't use Google Voice with my Google Apps account. And Google, please give me a break. Um, I'm paying you money. I'm a premium uh, customer. Uh, and I, I find this whole thing you know, very, very unpleasant, very uh, disappointing. Yeah, it's definitely frustrating. Uh, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Julio. I have several Gmail accounts, several Google Apps accounts, Twit. With, I mean, I access all of our uh, mail through our, our Apps account, and it makes using Google Plus very cumbersome. You have to juggle a bunch of different browsers or go incognito. It's, it can be done, but you're right, Julio. It's... It's a, it's a slap in the face. If you're using and Google and Google just announced that they're going to let Google Apps users um, uh, use Google Plus, but that raises a whole other question. I've, I've I've invested a lot of time in Google Plus on a generic Google account. I have more than you know more than five thousand followers. Am I going to be able to port that over, or do I have to start from scratch? I'm a little uneasy about how this is going to be handled. What do you think, Ayaz? Well, I think you guys are going to be even more annoyed because there's that <laughs> floating uh, video of of the redesigned Gmail that will. <laughs> That normal, not uh, not apps users. You know, the regular Google users will get first. Uh -huh. It looks like so. There's a, new, a video was out there. It said on the top, internal use only. And there's a bunch of screenshots that people got of this thing. It's got. Let's see. You can resize Gmail. It'll fit a lot easier, even in small windows. Uh, you can see on the top there, the action bar has changed. It's not so text heavy. It's all icon based. Uh, let's see. What else can we see here? Let's see here. 
They change the way conversations look. So if you scroll down, yeah, the, the threading go, of conversations. The threading looks a little bit different. You have like a an, an icon for the act, a profile shot of the person you're t that you're talking to. It's it's a very different look. You know, now, I mean, that, now that I look at this, it uh, seems to mirror a lot or some of what we saw in the ice cream sandwich announcement with how the ice cream sandwich version of the Gmail app is uh, approaching threading. Amazing. So Android and Google Teams yes. talking to I each know, other right? about design. <laughs> now, it looks a lot like the now preview. you're talking. It looks a lot like the preview theme that's available right now, but there are some changes to that. Like I told you about the action bar and the way the, com the conversation thing, that's brand new. That is not that is not the way emails look right now. And no. the search is improved search. I know this is odd for Google to do, but they did this. It's a lot easier to find stuff. You have a from field, to field, a subject field, so you don't need to even know the syntax anymore to find certain items in Gmail. Because normally you do a search from colon Sarah, mm -hmm. and yeah. then you could look for something, and you could check through dates. This is very helpful. This is actually something that I've been wanting for a really long time. Just give just give me a nice little box with a bunch of options so I can find that I, that I as email that he sent me a week ago instead of doing a little bit more of a blind search or but having to have remember syntax. This is going to be just Well, that's a, I I will I will appreciate it in one of my Gmail accounts. A couple of months later. Maybe I'm in the minority, but when I look at this design, it's like it's cleaner. Um it's it's nicer. It looks more modern, but at the same time I guess just because Gmail was in beta for so many years, I just got really used to the way it looks. And it seems like Google keeps, not only with Gmail, but Google Docs, Google Calendar, I mean, everything is, is kind of getting a new look. And we keep seeing these updates, and I'm like, too fast, too fast. Five years, I need five years. Anytime I see the preview, it says, hey, we have a new look. Would you like to try it out? I hit yes, because I need to get used to it. Yeah. It's like, I know this is, I don't really like the way this looks. I'm going to try I it anyway. I do the same thing. Same thing with uh, the preview theme on Gmail. I'm like, I don't really like it, but I'll try it. Hopefully yeah. Hopefully I'll get used to it. Well, because you're going to have to eventually. Yeah. I mean... That's well, the way it's going. You can go to classic view if you want, but then your screen is going to look different than other people's screens, and then you have fragmentation, and fragmentation we don't want that. Uh, finally, a uh, little bit more Google news. We talked a little bit about uh, what was going to be this whole Google Music twist that Andy Rubin had alluded to uh, yesterday, and it apparently, uh, Business Insider is citing a person in the recording industry, Anonymous, saying that users, the twist is that users will be able to share songs on a limited basis after they purchase the songs. The person who receives a song, uh, so the person who has been shared, uh, the person who is the sharee of the song will be able to listen to the song a set number of times or for a time period completely for free. That sounds a lot like, didn't Microsoft do this with the Zune actually? You could share songs. You could you listen can to it for a little bit. Songs. That was the squirting thing. I know this is. I got that's twice I've gotten that in this week. Squirting. Yes. Wait, that yeah, I uh, I'm, I'm counting. So yes, <laughs> two squirts. This is this week. A, is this a fantastic little feature? I mean, is this a twist that people like? I mean, you can you can go ahead and share songs on Spotify. You can do that on on a, a lot of streaming services. Is this a necessity nowadays, or is this something like eh? Well, I mean, what's different about something like Spotify is that you're paying for a subscription. So you're sharing a song with another Spotify uh, customer. And if you're both signed up, then, you know, you're, you're basically sharing a link, really, to mm -hmm. something that they could, they could get on their own. This sounds more of almost like it's like uh, renting a Kindle book to a friend who gets it for a certain amount of time, and then you get it back. And it's not actually anything that they get to keep. Wait a minute. No, I, well, I think I would assume you still have access to the song when you share it. I didn't even think about the idea that probably, but if the it's like a lending who, of a song, that would be even worse. Well, okay, yeah. so maybe the, imagine it's, it's like, why can't I listen to this song? Because I, I shared it with Jason. He's still listening <laughs> to it. I don't think it. people would be sharing much if they got rid of it. Less of a music. lending, but more of yeah. a here's a song for a limited amount of time mm -hmm. or for a, a limited amount of plays. Julio, what do you what do you make of this? Uh, does this seem like Google Music obviously has to differentiate itself from? All the other music services out there, is this is this the winning twist? Um, realistically, I don't know whether you know people are going to really want to do that. It's, it, it feels awkward. Your point that it, you know it's better to share a link than to share an actual file that goes back and forth seems a little awkward. But you know, here's my here's my situation. I've uploaded my entire music collection to Amazon. Google and you know when when uh, when the iTunes match comes out, I'm going to do essentially the same with Apple, and I'm going to have my 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 music collections in all three three places, and at that point, I'm going to take a really close look, um, and I may end up using all three, uh, and I'm kind of excited about that because it's kind of it's nice to have have a choice, and um, 
I think the way music music type stuff is integrated into Android devices, particularly tablets, is very nice. I like it. Um, and if they layer on music purchases and music sharing, I think that that's going to be that's going to be fantastic. Uh, I I'm, I'd like to see competition. I'd like to see you know three big companies going at this problem in slightly different ways. And, and very, it's a very exciting time. Yeah, and also it should be noted uh, or just kind of uh, affirmed here that what they're talking about is music bought through Google's music service, not necessarily your entire library. Right. So that narrows yes. that field down After even purchase. more. Right? The rumored Google uh, music service where yes. you can buy stuff. That's, right, there's exactly. There's a little that bit more exist, details yeah. there. there the Guardian says Google has signed up EMI, is in serious talks with Universal, and is just talking to Sony and Warner. So they've got one right. locked up, yes. maybe. And three others to line up by the end of the year. That's the, the rumor is it's going to it's going to launch in November or December, and well, this year, that's that's a pretty interesting goal. So, will you be able? And to that's share what it? yeah, the Andy Rubin saying we think we're close. We think we're pretty close. Although uh, um, November is really close. It's kind of ironic, isn't it, that all of these music services want to stand out in some way, but you still need those big four companies to mm -hmm. sign on, or you can't even play. You need. Google, Go ahead, Julio. Google has a problem, though. Um, Amazon has uh, what's probably going to be a very popular tablet device, uh, the Kindle Fire. Um, Apple has its iOS devices and iTunes. So they have this infrastructure that is going to uh, encourage um, a flood of purchases. And Google has nothing like that because its Android uh, tablet platform is nowhere at this point. It's it's a rounding error and. Without that, um, I, I have you know serious doubts about you know how well uh, a music uh, service like this is gonna is gonna do. Well, hopefully we'll find out in November. And with that, on to the news views. Google's Jean Baptiste Carreau is letting people know that Android 4.0 will be coming to the Android Open Source Project. Developers were getting antsy about whether or not Google was going to release code again after it failed to release Honeycomb source code. Carhu, sorry, I've been practicing French, so i got to talk that way, is, is, uh, says distributing the ICS code has been consuming his entire life for the last six weeks. So developers, Working on it. You can stop freaking out for, well, for now until they actually do it. AT&T released its earnings for quarter three and profits were $3.6 billion, which met analyst expectations. AT&T handled 2.7 million iPhone activations in the quarter, but also announced it already activated 1 million iPhone 4Ss. Now, those, those numbers will be reflected in AT&T's next quarter report, so expect a good quarter. A lot of good next quarters for anyone associated with that iPhone 4S. Mm -hmm. uh, more financials. Nokia had some bad news and some good news. The bad news first, the company had a 68 million euro loss in Q3. The be? good news is that Nokia beat expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Analysts thought Nokia was actually going to lose a lot more, 321 million euros. Feature phone sales actually helped uh, Nokia's bottom line by shipping 89.8 million units. Don't count out feature phones yet, says Nokia. Yeah, we're not that bad. Yeah, they're waiting for Microsoft to save their next quarter. You know what we haven't talked about in a while? What? Earnings. Oh, yeah. Microsoft reported its first quarter 2012 numbers, and they did pretty darn well. Revenues were set, were $17.37 billion, up 7% compared to last year at the same time, which beat analyst expectations that Microsoft would make $17.25 billion. Even the Skype acquisition, which happened in the same quarter, didn't dent Microsoft's money-making abilities. Wow, Microsoft, you are on a roll. Speaking at the Asia D conference, Samsung mobile exec Wan Pyo Hong said that when designing the Galaxy Nexus, patents were not really a heavy issue. Reportedly, Samsung's mobile president, Shin Jong Kyung, said that the Galaxy Nexus was designed to avoid infringing Apple's patents. So which is it? We're sure if Apple thinks Samsung is infringing, then there will be yet another battle in the ongoing patent wars. A vulnerability in Adobe Flash could allow shady websites to activate your computer's camera or microphone without first alerting you. Oh, boy. Adobe told CNET that the problem is actually on the Flash Player Settings Manager on Adobe's servers, which means you wouldn't have to do an update or anything, and the company is working on a fix. As for a timeline, Adobe said it may be fixed by the end of the week. End of the week. How about if it's on your own service, like fix it now. Right. Now. Well, it is Thursday, Ayaz. I mean, could be Monday, mm -hmm. and then the week would what be a lot farther away. 
or they have different fiscal weeks. I don't know. That's right. When is your fiscal weekend? And Microsoft's doing quarter of 2012 already. <laughs> Mark your calendars, everybody, because November 9th will be the day when you can get your hands on the new quad core NVIDIA Cal L powered Asus Transformer Prime. Asus chairman Johnny Shi showed the successor to the E pad transformer at the Asia D conference. The Transformer Prime has some serious style, even with the keyboard attached to it. Looks really thin. Shi didn't mention if the tablet would run on ice cream sandwich or not. But I'm sure somebody out there is hoping that it will. Man, to end up with a product named Prime after the Nexus Prime was the supposed name for the Galaxy Nexus for so long. People already know Prime and already associate it with something exciting. This is kind of good timing for us. Well, in the comments of the post, someone was like, well, I think Hasbro is going to sue them if you're going to have a Transformer called Prime. <laughs> they, they already have that. Yeah, really? <laughs> that's, that's true. Bloomberg reports that Windows Phone handsets will cost half as much to produce next year. Currently, it costs about $400 for a Windows Phone, and that'll be cut to $200 thanks to par uh, parts makers like Qualcomm working with Microsoft. The goal, of course, is to get as many Windows phones out there as possible. OCZ just announced the first one terabyte 2.5 inch solid state drive. OCZ told Engadget that it will take the company about three weeks to get the first units out. I'm sure you're wondering about the price. It's not a big deal. It's only 2200 US dollars. The drive is part of OCZ's new Colossus line for people who it's an SSD, one. A one terabyte SSD. That's awesome. Tiny little thing. Tiny so little it's thing. It's super fast. Yeah, it's good stuff. $2,200. You've got that. So you'll be... Uh, yeah, that's what I'll, I'll, I'll make sure my MacBook Air has <laughs> this yeah. thing in there. We'll just save it for three weeks. Actually, no, it wouldn't fit in the MacBook Air. I need a real laptop. Uh, I can actually swap out the hard drive. Bummer. You're going to have to rethink everything. A Lenovo. All, All of your... You need some new electronics. On to the randomizer. Randomizer. So, if I can, if I understand our randomizer story correctly, mm -hmm. a robot can now build another robot using foam by spraying foam that ends up hardening to create actual parts of robots. Yep. Am I understanding this correctly? Because I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this. Yeah, so, audio listeners would definitely suggest checking out the video to this uh, yeah, over really at the University of Pennsylvania, the Modular Robotics Laboratory. Well, they kind of made a modular robot, so go figure. I mean, that's what they do. Right. Uh, so here's how this works. There's a couple of actuators, and they're placed in a in configuration. Then a robot over there is spraying foam to connect everything. Now, the parts of the robot can actually tell where the other parts are in relation to each other, so they can figure out exactly what they're supposed to do. So the idea is you wouldn't have to have you know, a bulky skeleton to build, and you could just use these interchangeable parts, and by using foam, connect them. So this is kind of a... Uh, Horribly creepy thing, because now this thing... Oh, wow, this is oh, really that, scary. That left side arm doesn't look like it's coming up off the, the floor there. Yeah, it looks like it's they made some stuck. kind of robot animal yeah. looking thing. Uh, actually, it looks more like a turtle, I guess. Julio, what do you think? Do, when you watch something like this, are you excited, or do you see this as uh, the beginning of robots taking over human civilization? Skynet. <laughs> No, but I bet I bet Tom would be very excited about this because this is uh, this is the the prelude to uh, humans sending robots to the to other planets and setting up the infrastructure ahead of humans, which will will come later. So this is a very primitive, you know, version of that. There's very interesting things happening in robotics. Like for instance, here in the Twin Cities, there's a there's a, a robot called a Throwbot. It's basically this little cylinder with with two wheels. And you, you, literally, you literally throw it. It's, it's used by the military and law enforcement. If you're in a situation where you want to sort of scout out an area where there might be terrorists, you throw the robot and it has a camera and it sort of writes itself and sort of rolls around and, and you, you can see it, see what's happening on a little screen. Really, really interesting. There's just a ton of very interesting things happening in robotics these days. Absolutely. Thank you, Foam. You're making it all possible. Before we get to the calendar, I want to thank Vast Conference for sponsoring this episode of TNT. If you're like us, you have to you have to do conference calls on a regular basis. I mean, the, the Twit group, we're a mobile bunch. Sometimes we're not all in the same place at the same time, and we have to talk to each other. So you have to make sure that your conference call works. We have had conference calls in the past that did not work well at all. You know, you connect via Skype, and then you get a dropped call, or somebody loses connection. So here's what Vast Conference does. It gives you a dial-in number. You can give out for calls, right? 
at any moment's notice. The connections are very clear. It's very important. I mean, a lot of us have been on conference calls in the past where there's bad, there's bad audio, there's popping, VoIP can be, it can be just really squirrely. For large calls, you want to be able to manage all the people that are participating in the call. Fast conference can manage between two and 300 callers at once. So, I mean, take that into consideration. I mean, it really, really, really gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, they'll give you both a regular dial-in number and a toll-free number, very helpful. So you can use those to set up calls at any time. And calls are clear because they use fiber optic lines and high-end teleconferencing equipment, something you don't get from the other guys. Here's a great offer that VAST is giving viewers and listeners of TNT. VAST is giving our audience an exclusive two business calls free up to th 300 minutes to give you a chance to try out the service. Go to VASTConference.com, sign up for a free account, totally free, easy to do, fast and easy. You'll get that regular toll number and that uh, toll free 800 number so you can, you can start using the service. Use the promo code TNT to get those first two business calls free at VASTConference.com. Again, promo code TNT and we thank them so much for sponsoring uh, TNT. Good stuff. On to the calendar. Ubuntu has turned seven. Seven years old. Seven years. I don't know if that's so much a milestone. It just seems like that's, that's a long time. Seven U years ago? Ubuntu. I can never say that right. I just said it right there. Ubuntu. Ubuntu? It took me seven years to get that right. What did you say before? Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Ubuntu like is incorrect. Like cake. Yeah. Exactly. But is it right? And that operating system has really come a long way. It's so easy to install now. It's just ridiculous. Um, I really like it. Seven years later, and they're making it easier for Julio. Uh, another calendar item, according to Harold Campion, the world is about to end uh, really soon, in fact, uh, October 21st. Like, that's like really, really soon. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. So yeah. if you downloaded this, and that means you survived. Now, if you're worried, take into consideration that the same Harold Campion also said that the world was going to end last May 21st. And that didn't happen. Or it did, and this is all a or figment of my imagination. And we are in a post-apocalyptic world this, where robots build themselves with phones. This is foam. hell. <laughs> 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 so, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess uh, have a really great last meal, everybody. Yeah, we're, we're all going to be here tomorrow. Uh, if you are here tomorrow, uh, you'll be able to get something on the 27th of October, which is pretty cool. It's the Porsche-designed Blackberry. That's another word that people say differently. Some people say Porsche. Some people say Porsche. I, don't I know prefer the latter. Of, I don't know if a lot of people are going to be buying this, this Porsche design. It doesn't look anything like a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> what it, I, I don't, it looks I don't more know. like a DeLorean, actually. It does. Yeah, it really does. Julio, what do you? Is this? Is this? Do you like this in any way? <laughs> um, I, I, I like it fine. Uh, I, I believe, if I recall, there was a Porsche uh, laptop, um, and I think uh, Rim needs all the all the uh, uh, all the um, the design help it can possibly get because it's it's just it's just been hopeless in that department. Finally, Sony shipping PlayStation 3D displays on November 13th. These are 24-inch TVs that let gamers play uh, games in 3D. But also a cool function called SimulView, which delivers individual full HD screen visuals to each player in a two-player mode. You have to be wearing glasses, though, so it's not going yeah, to... Each player needs to have that. Yeah. They'll be out widely, says Sony. So good luck finding them. Yeah, we, we didn't we couldn't actually figure out where these the exact the areas. TVs were shipping, but it was on PlayStation's US, US webpage, blog, so we it, figure it's certainly US. Uh, but, there's an there's an Acer 3D uh, monitor that I reviewed in my in my tech call not not too long ago, and I hooked it up to a PlayStation 3 and watched some 3D movies, and it's um it was a lot of fun, but the the problem is uh, to to really appreciate the 3D, you need the, the bigger screen size, so I, I'm not sure it worked all that well with uh, with 27 inch monitor, but it was certainly certainly a lot of fun. All right, time to get into some viewer feedback. Incoming. Incoming message. First uh, email from Jennifer in Massachusetts. Hi, TNT crew. Yes, the 20 megabyte update bug is real. She's talking about uh, iOS. I'm on AT&T, and when I'm using 3G and I have several updates, if one is over 20 megabytes, the whole update stops. I can go into the App Store and I can update the apps individually or wait until I can use Wi-Fi. I started noticing this about a month before the iOS 5 upgrade. With all of the up updates before the upgrade, it was annoying to see I had 20 plus updates and the process just stopped when the second app was over the limit. 
And we got another voicemail and a couple of emails saying the same thing, but this person is saying that this was a, a bug before iOS 5. So maybe this has been there and people haven't noticed. I thought that's a little strange. You know, I, Hulu have, is this something that, that uh, you noticed? Uh, because I certainly have, I don't think this has been an issue for me. Yeah, the particular bug that we're talking about. I, it, you know, I gave up uh, uh, trying to update apps over, over 3GA. Just wait, wait till I get to Wi-Fi. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a related situation that I, I recently experienced, which excites me greatly. Now you can now restore uh, uh uh, your iPhone from a backup in the iCloud, um, and uh, if you lose your phone, you restore the other one exactly to its former state. But there again, there's a there's a situation of apps, you know, taking an eternity. I, that that restore took forever. Eventually succeeded. Eventually, I had a mirror image of the earlier iPhone, but the app downloads at one point just just froze. They stopped. You know, the progress bar stopped moving for a couple of hours. It was very weird. Hmm. You know, <laughs> on a related note, and this is pretty much just me not paying attention, but sometimes I'll have 30 apps or whatever that need mm -hmm. updating. So I go ahead and enter in my uh, my App Store password and I walk away. And maybe the third app was a web browser where you required Age to be restricted. 18 and over. Yep. So you have to say, OK, OK. And I've got a handful of apps that's just, you know, for whatever reason, I keep them around. That drives me nuts. But that's just kind of me uh, not being diligent about saying OK every time I get that uh that, that warning. All right. We want to thank uh, the folks at Reddit. Everybody at Tech News Today at Reddit.com for submitting all of the stories, which really, really help build our story rundown each week. We, we, we have you guys to help us um, decide what stories are popular. Sky Jedi, Grizzly82, Pangle, Lazion, White Hat TX, Coasty Green Man, and many more. Even if you don't have any stories to submit, you can always go to reddit.com slash r slash tech news today or tech news days uh, dot reddit dot com um, and, and even vote up and down. You know, if you like a story and you didn't submit it, don't worry about it. Just, just uh, have your voice. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and I think we've come to the end of our show. Julia o Ojeda Zapata, thank you so much for hanging out with us and helping us uh, make some sense of the news today. Tell everybody where we Thanks can. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Tell everybody where uh, they can find more of your work. Um, I work for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. You can go to twincities.com slash tech test drive. And uh, my, my personal homepage is ojezap.com, ojezap.com. And that'll point you to all my, my various blogs and projects and books and things. Excellent. You can always email us, technewstoday at twit.tv. Our voicemail is 260-TNT-SHOW. And tomorrow, we're going to have Darren Kitchen back on the show because it's Liquid Friday. See you tomorrow, everybody. I think it's TNT at twit.tv. Oh, TNT at twit.tv. I think Tech News Today goes there, too. I hope that works, too. Either way, <laughs> I'll read it. Just write us. Darn it. I always wanted to do jazz hands from Tom's seat. <laughs>